This video is called Nature of Science and is part of the expansion pack accompanying the original video, How It All Ends. This video will explore the nature of science a bit, looking at how it is unavoidably tentative and uncertain. The purpose is so that we can then do a better job of putting into context the things we hear about the science of global climate change. Let's start out with my assumptions. If we're talking about the meaning of life, then science can be informative, but it is just one tool of many equally valid ones, like faith, love, direct experience. But when we're talking about trying to predict and manipulate the physical world, I think that science is our best bet. It's certainly got by far the best success rate. As Carl Sagan observed, quote, if you want to know when the next eclipse of the sun will be, you might try magicians or mystics, but you'll do much better with scientists. They can routinely predict a solar eclipse to the minute a millennium in advance. If you want to save your child from polio, you can pray or you can inoculate. No other human institution comes close to science's ability to foretell future events, unquote. So I'm not worshiping at the altar of science. I'm just saying it's got by far the best track record for figuring out what happened, what is happening, and what's going to happen in the physical world. One more thing before we dive in. Scientific thinking and critical thinking, in my mind, are essentially the same thing. So as I talk about how science goes about figuring out what to believe, underneath it all, I am at the same time suggesting how we as individuals, as citizens, should go about deliberating issues. It's a well-established psychological phenomenon and is in fact entirely human to start out with your beliefs and then go looking for evidence to support them. The problem is we tend to forget or simply not hear the evidence that contradicts our beliefs. I mean, who wants to be shown that they're wrong? Formally, that phenomenon is called confirmation bias. The devilish result is that if you're not diligently aware of it, you could be served up a plate of equally balanced evidence and come out convinced that yours is the viewpoint that was better supported by the evidence because you gave greater weight to the evidence that agreed with what you already believed and discounted or simply didn't hear the evidence that contradicted it. So confirmation bias can serve to actually reinforce misconceptions in the face of evidence. That's why it's critical to be vigilant about it in your own thinking and why you'll hear me refer to it again and again. In science and in critical thinking, like we should all be trying to do with the climate change debate, it's the opposite. Instead of starting with beliefs and then looking for evidence to support it, you start by looking at whatever the evidence is and then use that to form your beliefs. I think that's pretty much what a chemistry professor of mine once meant when he was teaching us about climate change. He said, get informed and let it change you. That's sort of the nutshell of how a good scientist might go about advocating for something. He doesn't tell you what to believe. He just reminds you, start with the evidence and move to belief instead of the other way around. That's exactly what I've been saying! I can hear the shouting in my head right now from some online commenters who've latched onto my previous videos about climate change. Why don't we just go with the facts? Hey, sounds good to me. Simple, right? Just go with the facts? The sticky part is determining what exactly are the facts. Here's my example. I'll give a series of increasingly complex statements and you think about at what point we can no longer simply agree that it's a fact and instead have to do some interpreting. I have a candle sitting in front of me. Obvious fact. The candle is burning. Hopefully you can see that on low resolution, so reasonable fact. I'm sitting in a chair. Well, here you might ask for some more evidence before you pronounce a fact because you can't see it. So how about I show you? Okay, with a little checking, fact. Except the problem is I'm not really sitting in the chair because what's really going on on an atomic level is that my outer electrons are repelling the outer electrons of the chair strongly enough that I am actually hovering imper imperceptibly above it, just like magnets can push on each other without actually touching. Okay. Don't be such a dork, you say. Some things are just obvious. You're being tricky. Some things are just obvious. Well, one of my favorite quotes about that, being obvious, that is, comes from Buckminster Fuller. In fact, my students have to walk underneath the quote to get into my room. He said, everything you learned about the universe is obvious. It becomes less and less obvious as you begin to study it. And Galileo said, the truth can sometimes be deceptive. I once looked down from the mast of a ship departing harbor and thought, look there, the shore is moving. This becomes a central point, because while we may all agree that for all intents and purposes I am sitting in this chair, when we shout at each other about whether the globe is warming or not, it turns out both claims are subject to the same question. How are we to decide whether something is a fact or not? It's not always as clear-cut as we'd like. This may seem like splitting hairs, but it becomes kind of important if you have a question about a complex system or a really important issue, like, gee, is that asteroid going to hit the Earth or barely miss? Is this case of bird flu a human-to-human -human transmission or not? Is the globe warming or not? Are we the ones doing it or not? Sophistry, you cry. We can just look at the evidence. Well, problem is, evidence still needs to be interpreted, which can be done poorly or skillfully. 
You see webbed foot tracks in the hall, come across a shimmery green feather, and hear a quacking sound. You conclude that there must have been a mallard duck who recently went by. It's obvious based on the evidence. But is it possible it's actually a kind of duck you've never seen before? And had you been better trained as an ornithologist, you would have known that the green was slightly the wrong hue for a mallard and the tracks a little too big? Interpreting evidence well takes skill, training, and experience. You wouldn't propose lowering prescription drug costs by hiring my high school chemistry students instead of people with PhDs to research the drugs, would you? They both look at the same printouts from the same machines. They both look at the same evidence. Whose interpretation of the evidence are you going to trust? Well, then let me do it myself, you say. Um, go for it. But then don't be expecting me to accept your drugs, which is the case with climate change since it's global, which means you're not the only one affected by your decision. I'll stick with the professionals, thanks. Here's an example I often give my students. I tell them that we're going to get creamed in Friday night's football game because, have they heard? The opposing side's offensive line has an average weight of just over 300 pounds. That usually worries them. And then I tell them that the linemen weigh 110 pounds, 103 pounds, 98 pounds, 97 pounds, and 1,120 pounds. This leads to a discussion of the difference between the mean average and the median average, and it gets them to question their faith a little bit in the reality so obviously implied by such a simple number as the average. If something as simple as the average can be so tricky, how come we're okay with Joe Schmoes like you and I doing armchair analysis of climate science, one of the most complex topics in human history, instead of leaving it up to the scientists? Why does evidence need expertise to interpret? Well, because things are almost always way more complicated than they seem. I once cornered a Yale University particle physicist at a wedding reception, because even though I teach physics and chemistry, I've always got some questions myself and no one around to answer them. Anyway, I, wanted, I asked him how big an electron really is. I'd been wanting to know for a while, so I was determined to get a solid answer. Well, an hour and several diagram-covered napkins later, I finally got him to grudgingly assent to a single-sentence answer that we'd negotiated like it was a UN treaty. Turns out the deeper you go, or the bigger the system, like climate, the less accessible the evidence is to easy interpretation. Fair warning, if you're an expert in some field of the physical sciences, you'll probably want to avoid me at parties. Yeah, but not everything is as complex as climate, you say. You're right. Some things are simpler, like 1 plus 1 equals 2. Here's Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead's proof of that self-evident mathematical statement. This is part of why all science is inherently uncertain and tentative, because the world is tremendously complex. So how do we get any answers? Well, you delve as far into the complexity as you need to for your purposes, and then you quit, or as far as you can get with your measuring instruments, and then you quit, and then you make an explicit statement of how close you think you probably got to the true value, acknowledging that you'll never get there. The goal, of course, is to make that uncertainty as small as possible. There's a couple of basic ways of doing that. The first is to be very careful about what biases or preconceived notions the scientist brings to the table. The scientist Conrad Lorenz summed up that duty when he wrote, quote, it is a good morning exercise for a research scientist to discard a pet hypothesis every day before breakfast, end quote. Why? Because if you aren't aware of your preconceived notions, then you are susceptible to the trap of confirmation bias, starting with belief and then looking for evidence, rather than the other way around. This can be insidious because you don't realize you're doing it, and as a result, you become more confident of your conclusions than the evidence really merits. The author Douglas Adams put it perfectly when he observed that assumptions are the things you don't realize you have. That's what that whole candle thing was about. Let's see a couple more examples. You'll probably be on your guard now, but see if you can do more than just avoid being tricked. See if you can identify the assumptions you hold that allow me to mislead you.